Welcome to the Spectrum of Health podcast. Today, guys, I've got a very special guest. If you're on Instagram, I know you've seen his 5 a.m. workouts. They're, scared, they're scaring me because I know I ain't getting up at 5 a.m. Um, Mr. Super Dad himself, uh, Damien Scannell. Man, thank you for joining me, man. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. I was uh, I'm literally done one of them workouts this morning, bro. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. I'm high on energy, man, and uh, thank you very much for having me, bro. No, thank you, man. Yeah, obviously... Um, I've been seeing your content for a long time. I was well aware of you, even when you first, when you opened the Simply Fit Gym. That's when I first kind of come across you, but I actually knew your brother. So bit of a okay. bit of a background story. Your brother's a few years older than me, but when I was a youngster at Palace, he used to come down, like when he was just breaking into the first team, he used to come down to the Dome, you know, National Sports Centre? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He come yeah. down to the Dome and, and just like train with the kids. So he'd train with us. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, so yeah, I've actually known your brother for a long time. And then one of my best friends, um, Tariq Holmes Dennis, they were teammates at Huddersfield. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I know. Was he yeah. from Wolves? Did he go, no, what club was he at Tariq before? was at Charlton. Charlton, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, man, so uh, yeah. So thank you for joining me, obviously. Um, I just want to get straight into it, man. So. Obviously, you play sports yourself, you play football, you've got quite a long history in, in football. I was doing my research on you. Obviously, always got to research on my guests before I, before I invite them on. And uh, yeah, I just kind of want to know, like, talk to me a little bit about, like, your childhood in, re in relation to football and, and how you kind of got started and got into it. Okay, um... So, Jay, you know what? I obviously play my brother. He he has higher pedigree, so he came through the system from eight years old. I think he was at, um, he went from Arsenal to Palace. So that was his route. That was that was completely different to mine. So I went through um, like grassroots. I was playing for like my local team, which was at Addison Corinthians. Then I, then there was actually quite a large part where I didn't play football. Like I mingled with other kind of like stuff, more anti-social stuff. You know, okay. getting in a bit of trouble, and then. Um, what happened is I am um, at the age of 18, I think it was 17, 18, I actually, there was a court case. I actually had a court case, right? And I was playing for a local team called Downham Tavern. And um, we played a preseason game, right? And um, during that preseason game, um, we played against a team called Maidstone and there was a few people watching. I scored two goals. And some guy came up to me and said, oh, do you want to play? And I said, look, man, I got a court case. I don't think it's looking too well. And that guy, his name's Sammy Mudd. He actually helped me. He wrote like a character reference and stuff and he helped me like financially in certain aspects he helped me quite a lot really he got me a flat and stuff and that was like oh, wow. the start of my football career like he was like at the point I used to call him my footballing dad you know so um from there I um went into non-league and stuff Jay okay so you didn't go the academy route you didn't go through that no 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 I didn't really if I'm being honest my dad yeah he he didn't really um really sh like introduce us to football so I didn't really have like other than seeing like top end footballers sometimes on the weekends you know like in, involved in games I didn't really know the like pyramid of football so I thought it was like that was football and everything below it was just like grassroots yeah obviously there was a bit in between yeah but I didn't know like to the capacity of like how how big professional football was yeah and how desired and and and, and how much people wanted to play it yeah and um, it was only when I got into that kind of like like non league kind of like arena where I realized, whoa, you can make money here, you can do this yeah, here. And yeah. although it wasn't entirely money, it obviously eases some kind of like financial anxiety when you know that you can collect an income from doing something you love. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, in terms of as a, as a kid, like, what made you want to play in the first place? I just think I'm hyper competitive, man. I'm hyper competitive. So, like, you know, I look back and people, you know, people say they love football. I definitely don't love football to the degree that, like, some people are obsessive. Like, they watch DL and they, then like, but me, like, if I play basketball, man, I, I go to war with you. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so I think I'm, like, very tenacious. I'm very competitive and, I, and I'm very, like, full on. And I think getting into football and where all the boys are into football, I'm like, you're not better than me. And even right. though they may have been, they may have loved it more than me because, you know, then people that used to get the Premier League books and <laughs> yeah, I wasn't that kind of in it, but I'm just super competitive, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So then when you was growing up as well, was it, obviously I know you said that there were some antisocial times in your life as well, but school-wise, was he very academic? Not so much? No, no. Mm. I'm, like, I'm actually sitting in, this is an irony of it, I've got my... Um, old head of year around for lunch now, right? <laughs> so he's listening to this. Um, 
we um, in school at, I would say at points, man, in certain areas, I, I, I probably would be considered like a decent pupil, right? I was in, sometimes I was in, <laughs> he's laughing, I was, uh, uh, I was in the higher sets and stuff, but my behavior didn't reflect that, man. I was, a, okay. I, I would probably what you could deem as a nuisance student. <laughs> and um, I was regularly in trouble getting suspended and stuff like that. And he was actually probably a big part of why I actually even stayed in school. Okay, wow. Well, big him up, man. Big him up. <laughs> yeah, Peter, 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 amazing big up, man. <laughs> big up, Peter. So, yeah. so with that then, obviously, I, I, I feel like nowadays, and when I was younger, obviously I'm a few, I'm a, few, a bit younger than you, but when, when I was growing up, sometimes I feel like, playing football for a lot of kids and I'll say I'll be straight a lot of black kids sort of see it as like a way out right like this is like a way to escape our environment sometimes was that sort of would you say that wasn't really the case for you because you said you never really loved football to that depth so or not really yeah, I definitely at a young age I definitely didn't see it as a is the lighting gone off no it's, it's fine it's cool it's fine yeah, yeah it's um, cool. at that uh, um when I was younger, I, didn't, I definitely didn't see it was like a way out in terms of financially. Like I saw it more as a, like a popularity thing to begin with. Mm. You know, like I, I saw it more as like if he was good at football, he was popular. I saw, yeah. I definitely saw that, but I never knew that it was earning potential anything other than like the, the superstars. Yeah, and like I didn't, really, I didn't really necessarily aspire to be a superstar footballer while I was in school. Yeah. I, I liked being the best at football, but I didn't know like because my my dad didn't turn around and say to me like. Look, this is what Premier League footballers do. Like, like he, he's an old school Irish guy, man. He, yeah. he, he was more he, like he, he more wanted to introduce me to like mannerisms and stuff like that. Like, yeah, football, like he didn't have a clue, man. Yeah, yeah. And also, you got brothers, right? Are you are you, are you the oldest? So I've got a middle brother. My older brother, my older brother was very similar to me. Um, in regards to like, he didn't really have an insight to football. But my younger brother, by the time I had started to develop and he saw what I was doing and saw how that I was playing the game and I was good at it. He, he obviously picked it up and the exposure that he got to it and saw it and he got picked up early. He's went into Arsenal. He's seen a whole different life. Yeah. You know, I, I never saw that. I've never, I've never saw the back end of football until I was like, even non league, you don't really see it properly until I actually became, went on trial at clubs. That's when I saw, wow, yeah. this is what yeah. you like at these clubs, you know? Yeah. And I saw that. Um, so you ended up signing a professional contract at, at some point in your career. So kind of talk to me about that, that experience. Jay, that, that was crazy, man, to be honest, because literally from the when I went and signed for these non-league clubs I was still very half-hearted and to be honest uh I was still like partaking in like crime to some degree so, like like I was doing like these asbo kind of things man these things that wasn't really making me money I wasn't like like you no know, Al Capone but I was doing stupid things right. so I was earning money from there and then I was playing football as well so when I there was a purple patch where I was fantastic man I think like we probably all had it as footballers where everything I touched turned to gold right and um, I kind of it kind of brought me into this self belief thing that whoa whoa man I don't think many people are better than me you know that with the feedback and uh, a few agents got in contact with me the next thing I realised I was getting contact from Nottingham Forest Swansea and stuff like that um, it all came to a head South End came for me made an official bid at Eastley uh, I agreed terms and I went up there so it wasn't like this strategized <laughs> plan you know right. like of like oh pe- everything got pieced together it was like more of like I kind of bought into myself a little bit more, I was a little bit more confident and the people around me happened to be able to connect the dots at that time and I ended up in the league, bro. So. Mm. And then, so what was that transition like? Going from non-league, I'm sure the money changed, the lifestyle changed. And <laughs> yeah. was, it, was, it, did you, did, was it a transition of also going from part-time to full-time? Like what, how yeah. did that all I, work? I didn't handle it well, if I'm being honest, because at the time, I thought I handled it well, right? So I sh- the transition across, yes, you earn more money, your status is, rises, right? Uh, so you become more popular. So at, at the time, like, I became, like, the best friend to have, you know? Like, I became, like, the footballer with more finances and, and more access to, when really I should have knuckled down. I wasn't earning enough. I think at my peak in, in, in the league, I was making £1,500 a week, right? So... Look, man, at the time, you couldn't have told me no different. That was like 100 grand, you know? Yeah. But in, 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 in hindsight, you're never going to retire on that. And um, what, what happened is, man, and my behaviour, so I carried the non-league mentality into the, into the league because in, the, in non-league, you can get away with certain behaviours that just can't stand. The quality is better, the mentality is better, so I needed to up my game. If, if you told me, there was, again, I had a purple patch in the league and stuff like that. If you told me that I think that, I could have handled my own there, yes. But did I? Definitely not. 
I just I just crumbled under the pressure, man. Like I would attend, still be doing the night south thing. Come, I was in South London at the time. I was coming back to South London. The people I was hanging around weren't football orientated people because you, you have to start living and breathing it, you know. Yeah, so, some, yeah. some some of these people have played football from eight years old all the way to their thirties, yeah. middle of their thirties, and you can't just come in and and partake. You have to yeah. be full on, right? Yeah. So when you got to that stage, though, like when you got got there, you got into league football, you got the professional contract. In some in some in some ways, you're living a lot of people's dreams. So you lived a lot of people's dreams. Um, would you say you did, did? You have like the ambition and the mindset to feel like you wanted to to kick on, like you wanted to go up championship. Prem was that in your mind, or was it just? Well, like... I thought it was given. I thought it was given. To be honest, I thought you was owed it. I thought you go in, you play well again, and, and you end up there. And I, I didn't realize that everything has to be up. Yeah. The mentality, the work ethic. I wasn't ready for it. So, so you know, when you talk about the dream, yeah. Sometimes, as as young people, as young players, you set about this dream when you're like 16, 17 year old, right? Or this goal, right? And you don't actually have like um, the mentality, like it's just a, it's, it's a goal. So like yeah. along the way, man, you need to develop it and you need to understand it. And I, I don't think I was, I think I was quite immature in that sense. So, so when I hit that point where I probably needed to like double down in certain aspects, right? I was still quite immature and I thought, I'll just have another purple patch or right. I'm still good, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, you get, in, I'm surrounding myself with a lot of people that pat me on the back. So it, it's, 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 it's just a false environment and then you don't really realise until you're coming all the way back down, right? Right. So, yeah, talk to me about that then, like not getting another contract or getting released or whatever that situation was. Like, how did it feel to... What was that process? So, so Jay, even that, I avoided it. So, when I was at Southend, um, they got relegated and I got offered an opportunity to renew my contract there or go to Dagenham and Redbridge um, on less money. But Dagenham and Redbridge was League One. And I kind of like wanted to remain with the status, right? Rather than probably doing what was probably best for my career. Because at the time, Dagenham and Redbridge were renowned for playing long ball. South End were like a, pro- not a proper football club, but a football club that played in a particular way and which more suited me. But with my, with the popularity, the status, I wanted to stay as high as possible, one level below the championship. My brother was in the championship at the time, mm. <laughs> you know? So um, I've signed for Dagenham. That would probably say if if, if signing for Southend was the the, the way up, <laughs> Dagenham was definitely on the way down. <laughs> even though, even though they was in League One, it just all went peeped on. The whole behaviour inside the club was very non-leagueish. They were they're an old school club. They come from non-league, so they would they was like they were like a old machine, you know, like an old machine. Yeah, and I came in and I didn't fit in. And I, w- I hadn't compounded that that like mental strength, so I was like kind of like fragile. I didn't really want to work, and then I didn't want to go on loan. I, be- I wasn't really someone that would would want to go outside of London. That obviously South End, but you know that's forty five minutes down the road. Yeah. I didn't want to go on loan to like Plymouth or something like that. Yeah. And it was a disaster. And um, from there, I went to Eastleigh, and it was just like a rocky road down. I was like a mercenary, you know, like someone that if a manager phoned me and said, oh, do you want an extra hundred and fifty quid?" I'd be like. Oh, Cool. Yeah, you're gone. Yeah, and then, and then, and then I'd be trying to make around. I was like a Del Boy. And at the time, I'm 26, 20, no, I'm sorry, 27, 28. And like, I'm just negotiating my downfall. It's not really like trying to better myself. And then I'm yeah. thinking about, oh, if I get 600 quid and I work and I get 600 quid and then that's 1,200 quid a week, right, you know? Right, right. Jay, I'm not really thinking like forward, you yeah, know? I'm just thinking yeah. of now, trying to make yeah. a living. Yeah, and obviously, you know, you're always posting your, your beautiful children and stuff. Like, what app? Was you did you have a family at that stage or not not yet? Yeah, that was like another turning point. So if coming out of the league was like a, a realization. So I had my child when I was 28, right? And at okay. that particular time I was at Bromley. And like life wasn't good for me, man. So from the outside perspective, I was earning half decent money. There was no real money in the bank account. There was um, no real substance. I was delivering parcels every day, it was monotonous, it was like groundhog day. So but for me. When I had my first child, it was like a little bit of a realisation. And it was around the same time that my dad died. You know, and, I, and as much as I'd like to believe that there was future in me for football, I think that was really a point where I thought, whoa, like, you know, like, what, what else is left in the game for you? Like, you know, like financially, especially. So um, I started to like, I think that's about the time I got qualified as a personal trainer as well. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. And okay, so... What kind of so when when did you like say when did you actually call it a day fo- football wise? Well, that being said, I did stay. I just I just kind of viewed football as not a primary source of like 
even though it was my main source of income, I knew that it wasn't going to be my primary source of income for long. Um, at 30, 30 years old, 30 years old, I got an injury in pre-season playing for Tunbridge at the time, which was unfortunate. I was still earning £350 a week, which is considering you're only training twice a week and playing. Yeah, it's all right, it's considerable. It's not bad, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I've just signed a new deal. I got a dead leg. And then I went on to find out it was... Um, that dead leg had developed bone tissue or bone fragments in uh, it. Ah, like ossification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it's like a rare thing. It's where I did experience a lot of trauma in that area. And uh, they said to me, look, man, the road to recovery could be 18 months with an operation. Yeah, like, it, it, and, and, and at that level, earning that much, man, and the fact that I just started doing Simply Fitness, I was like, no, 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 no. It was, I cried, man, I cried. And um, imagine this, so I had nine months left on my deal. Tom Bridge said to me, look, we can give you 1,700 quid. So I was given 1,700 quid, like, brown brown uh, envelope to, to retire from a game yeah. that I'd given my last 10, 12 years to. So that was another yeah. realisation. Yeah, wow. So, like, me- mentally then, also you said you cried, like, how, could you describe where you was at, at that stage, like? I was distraught. I just thought I, 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 I deserved more from it. You know, I thought like I'd given so much. I thought that coming to the end, like probably like we all do, man, probably how we feel like when we're going to die, I thought he's going to go out of a bang. You know, I thought like <laughs> you get a big check or something like that. But um, yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely happened. It was just distraught. And you know what? If I'm being honest, when I reflect on it, that a lot of them tears were fear because right. there, there wasn't much like, man, I was thinking 350 pounds minus, oh, whoa, that's... £1,400 a month and, you know, like, oh, where does that come? I've just opened Simply Fitness, so I can't... And then, oh, man, I was doing Korean at the time, but part-time because I needed my business. And I was like... And then I can't really show this to my missus because what the heck if she gets an insight to how bad things are? I've got a little man on the way. I've got friends that, that know me as Damien that plays football. That is, there's so many things. And I was just like... And I think that was the main reason why the, 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 I cried, bro. So. Yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense, man, and that's real. Like, yeah, I always talk to I always talk to people about like I, I got let go from professional football really young, so I, I did my scholar. I didn't even get offered a pro, and I remember I was sat in front of my house. It was a hot day, and I had knee surgery, so I was going on all these trials. And when I had the knee surgery, the surgeon told me I got I got about eight eight weeks. I had a trial with the Oval first team in, in six weeks. So I'm like, well, I got to go. I, I need I need to get I need to get a contract. So I went. But my knee was like a balloon. Um, I remember I come back and I'm just sitting in front of my steps and my mom's looking at me in it. She's looking at me through the window upstairs, in it. And I just literally, I'm sitting on the steps, just crying my eyes out, in it. So yeah. like, it's, it's mad because I don't think, sometimes when people don't play football, or they don't play sports, they don't really realise like the mental kind of, it's like, it's yeah. almost, it's almost traumatic. Yeah, yeah. So your dream isn't just to play football, it's the dream of a life while yeah. playing football. So yeah. when, it, when it's ripped from you, Man, it, it, it's like it's like whoa! It didn't turn out the way I thought. Yeah. It's a fairy tale, you know. But yeah, and and, and also you got it's all the pressures that you've created by telling, like speaking it into existence. So now your your mom's like, oh, so he's not going to be a footballer, and your yeah. friends are like, it's Jay, not Jay's not the footballer no more. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, man. You, you know, you know. I think it's kind of the best thing to happen to me because now, not to say I'm more resi- well, I am more resilient, but it's more understanding of like. It's all just part of the journey. It's progress, you know. It's progress, like, it, and and it's it's not necessarily what happens. It's how you respond, Jay. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's true. So then, with that being with all that being said, then and you know, getting to that stage in your journey, you know, thirty years old, you got you've got your kids on the way, and you know, now you kind of stop playing football due to the injury. You you said you got qualified at twenty eight. Twenty eight, twenty nine, I think, Jay. Okay. Know? So what 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 drew you to you know deciding to go down the fitness route, like? Was that something you always loved? Like, what, yeah, what, what pulled you in that direction? So, um, if I'm being honest, um, I haven't always loved fitness yet, but I like helping people, right? And I like empowering people. And when I saw, like, when I always saw PT in you, I always kind of viewed it as that, like, in a weird way. Like, you know, like empowering people. And I, I've always kind of viewed myself as a pretty, like, ambitious kind of guy. Like, you know, so I think it was kind of thing. If, if, at no point did I think I was going to go full on with it, if I'm being honest. I thought it was going to be like, man, if I have a couple people I do a week and it's, and it's 50 pound an hour, everyone talks about 56 pound an hour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that man, I, I can make a 300 quid a week from doing that. They make it sound like, easy. They make it sound yeah, like it's easy. It's easy. Yeah, is it? Listen, if anybody's thinking of being a PT while watching this, man, don't buy into that model. Yeah, don't buy into that model. Yeah. It's a myth. It's a myth. Yeah. So um, that, that being said, yeah, I, I went on that journey. 
qualified as a PT, my partner, so me and my partner were on the same course at the same time. And we both had this kind of like idea of setting up a small studio where we would do things part time, you know, in the evening or swap small group classes or whatever. But yeah, that, that kind of evolved. You know why? Because it's that self-belief thing again. You know, when you, you do something and there's interest and it, it, at the time, social media, I put something up and it gave me, got me a couple of likes and I started getting really happy with it, you know, and stuff like that. So that, that kind of compounded and um, we, set, we, we set up this gym. It wasn't called Simply Fitness to begin with. It was called Trinity TDS. Okay. Trinity, Trinity TDS, yeah. And um, we, we um, I'll never forget it, Jay, man. We, uh, we, had, we got flyers printed. <laughs> Yeah, probably like the worst marketing to ever. We got flyers printed. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have the money to um, get some of the was out, handing out the flyers. Um, the, the, the very said teacher that I spoke about before, he helped me hand out the flyers. Um, I was quarrying in the morning, and I remember I got the first phone call from the first client. Her name was Mavinda Law. I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if you can legally actually say her name on this year, but her name was Mavinda Law. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and, um, I'll cut that one out. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. and um, listen to this day. She, I didn't even know my prices. So she's phoned up here and she's gone, because um, I didn't, I, I don't know, man, I think I would believe in myself, I didn't believe in the business. She's phoned up and she's gone, oh, um, I want to book 10 sessions. Um, I see you're a local studio and she's like, how much is it? And uh, I was like, well, like I said, it was like, first session free. <laughs> 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 so like, uh, obviously that gave me the time to come. But yeah, that, that, that was how the journey started. So looking back, people would like to say like, oh man, we, we had a business, no business plan, no business plan. I had the money that I retired with. I had the income that I was making from Corrine, which was part-time. That was it. That was it. That was it. And then probably the excess change that I had in my account that would get me from up there. That was it. And there was no business plan. It was just, all right, I'm going to do some one-to-ones and some, I'm going to get some flyers and the healthy momentum helped me from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you was doing classes and one-to-one PT at that time, yeah? That was the idea. That was okay. the, idea. <laughs> that, the idea of doing classes and executing is two separate things. So when, when I did start doing classes, I wasn't getting paid much. It was mostly friends. It was mostly friends and the people that they brought, I would charge. Okay, All right? um, okay. Yeah, this, this is probably why it's like the resilience built up, you know, because I was doing a lot of things for free. I was, and, and, and the, general, the general joy that I got from helping people was actually a, a, a reward enough Right. Obviously, I needed to pay my bills, you know, and yeah. I was still managing to correlate at the same time. Yeah. So um, the small classes actually developed because of my particular type of, like, mentality. So, you know, I'd combine in, like, you probably do the same thing, sports and kind of, like, gym. You know, like, where, like, sports has this kind of great kind of camaraderie potential, like, uh, uh, approach to, to, to training. So a lot of people who don't do sports don't realise that, that it's very competitive, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, like that. So I introduced that into my kind of... In, into the kind of like niche approach and people bought into it Jay to be honest and uh, it, people people liked it people liked the personality that I brought with with it yeah. and it kind of compounded man and, and it was uh, it was a, that was the start of the journey yeah okay so so with that then how long how long were you running running that uh, running the gym before do you still operate the gym now or? no so we, we don't operate the gym before we, we ran that gym for five years Jay, five years five yeah. years Five years. We, was, God, was, that up, was that up till the pandemic? Up until the pandemic, but we was already transitioning to go online. Oh, so okay. when, when, when we was when we, we got to the point, so at no point for the first two years was the gym earning enough to to to, to like completely entirely cover bills and stuff. Right. So we was doing sessions for like three pound J. You know, like our whole business model was behind low cost and high numbers. Right. Like, Get as many people in as we could. And, and, and again, like any PTs or watching this probably think that that's a good model. Yeah, well, it's not. A, there's not actually a good or bad model. It's just your own personal preference. Yeah, but the, the particular areas in and what we attracted didn't really get. Not, but the biggest thing was we never wasn't getting results. We were getting people turning up, but it was thinking oh, I was only three quid and stuff like that. You, you, you probably experienced it as well, you know, Jay. Yeah. So um, we done that for about two or three years. Then my partner set up a a, a, a women's group, a women's only group. Uh, which which done fantastic was which was a little bit more costly and I started doing something called Spartan sessions uh, and from that day like that was like the that was probably like the turning point for our business because we we created structure people bought into the style of training that I was doing kind of like was compressed into like into like a, a, a belief system so people thought come to the Spartan session 
and and this is what happens. I become a Spartan, you know, like right, and then my right. partner was turning women into to fit women because she's called it simply women. So that was probably the turning point or one right. of the turning points to get right. where we are now. So would you say that there was an element of where you, you niche down to more target and you got more back from it? Oh man, that, that was a, you know, I didn't know I was doing it at the time, but that 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 happened. But the, another turning point was that. I started training a guy named Wayne Danai. We'll probably talk about him more, yeah. He then taught me the importance of doing that. Even though I'd done that, not, not, not knowing what I was doing, he then taught me about how to niche further down, that like you want right. to repel as many people as possible. Right, So right. Yeah, that, that was, that, what you just said there was key. The fact yeah. that I then started to gain the confidence to say, no, I don't want other people. I just want a particular niche. Yeah. So one, but before we kind of get into what you're doing now, I've got one question because I always... I come across this a lot, especially with young footballers who don't make it, right? So when you kind of stepped away from football, obviously it's a little bit different because you was, you was doing non-league and you was working part-time anyway. But when you was no longer having football as an income and you had to just work, like you just work now, like how did you find that transition? Because I'll give you a bit of an insight, like from my perspective, a big, I, I went to the States after I didn't get a scholarship, right? I, I went like a year later. And a big part of why I went is because I guess there's a little bit of fear, but like I didn't want to work. <laughs> I'll tell you right yeah, now, I did, yeah, I, yeah. I, I did not envision myself working. <laughs> so I was like, let me go to the States. I get to play full-time yeah. football again for another four years yeah. in another country, and I get a degree. So I just, I was like, I'm good. So how was that kind of in your mind? Like, did you see yourself? Like, could you, did you, did, did like, yeah. How did you feel not being able to make money from football and it was just, okay, I've actually got to work now? Fortunately for me, as I said, I think you made a good point there. The route that I came and and the career I had allowed me to be very real with the fact that like my financial space never got to the point where I thought, oh, this might be retirement kind of, you know, I never had a bank balance like that. But I definitely see that amongst my friends that I've met in the game that have come through, that have come from right from the young ages, man. They very, they very much struggle with that transition. But for me, like probably reflecting in like what I do now, yeah. Like I kind of like enjoy that kind of hustle. I kind of enjoy that hustle. I kind of enjoy the hustle. I enjoy, I, when I view something as competition, it like, it makes it good for me. You know, do you get what I'm saying? So like even yeah. like business, PT and stuff like that, like not, not to say I, I like source competition. I'm like, I want to get him or something like that. Yeah, but it excites me the fact that I can improve myself and stuff like that. So when I, when I have work around something that's passionate and I've, and I've tapped into you but it's not too bad, Jay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. but I definitely I definitely see what you're saying, though. See the players that come through the system and do the YTS, yeah? Yeah. If you ever show them a shop floor... Or... Yeah, it's like... That, that's like my worst nightmare. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, and that's a big driver to kind of why, why I decided to start coaching as well. Because I just... I could... I, yeah, I couldn't work for people. It was just... It was hard. So, yeah. cool. So, talk to me a bit about... Uh, so, there was a period where... He was going by Dr. Damo. Do you still go by Dr. Damo too? Because that's that's how I first came across <laughs> or the gym and Dr. Damo. You, you, you know what, um, Jay? I Dr. Damo was a handle I was given by um by Insta. So okay. I, I didn't I didn't I, you know I've been criticized for that. I mean actually on social media, people be like, you're not even a doctor and stuff like right. that. But what actually happened is I typed in my name, like Damo or something like that. Damo oh, and it was took so that they gave me suggestions and it was like Dr. Damo. It wasn't like I thought in my head. Man, I'm a doc. I think I actually had that before that handle. I think I had that before I was actually like personal training. Do you get right. what I'm saying? So, okay. so yeah. But but I, I ran with it and it kind of was fit into what I was doing. Yeah. So, but the transition came when I actually decided to niche right down and um and just work with dads. Yeah, okay. So yeah. let's talk about that then. So when when did that transition happen? And uh I guess why 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 was that the target market you decided to go for? So I used to train my, 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 my demographic that I was aimed at before. I used to work with a lot of sports people and footballers and stuff. But as, as rewarding as it was, it was like, they're quite hard to work with. I'm not sure if you've worked with any athletes. Yeah. But like they're, 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 they're so driven and they're so, like, they've got their particular mentality and they're so self-absorbed, man. Like it's kind of difficult. And I found it quite difficult to communicate with them and stuff. And then... Um, I wasn't getting paid enough to give them that much attention, you know? So um, the, the coach that I worked with said, man, look, man, I, I think you're perfect for dads. I think, especially in this current era of like, this whole like 
feminization of men and stuff like that. Even yeah. like, listen, man, I, I think it's really important that you kind of show them that. Like, Look, man, let's own our health, like, and let's own our mentality. Let's not be afraid to to to, to throw ourselves about still and stuff like that. And man, I, I loved it. I loved it from my very first like kind of step and helping dads and listening to them talking how I'm improving their life for their children. Man, yeah. yeah. Now, like, now I, I couldn't, I, like, I couldn't see myself doing anything else, man, because yeah. I see how empowering it is, you know, Jay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So then, was was the pandemic like a big a big driving force for you? Because, like, I'll tell you a little bit. I, I used to coach in in Liverpool Street in at F forty five. That was kind yeah. of where I was coaching, and then obviously the pandemic came. I went from teaching like fourteen classes, getting paid X amount for each class, to literally one class on a Saturday. So my, obviously <laughs> my money just went from that to that. Yeah. And I just thought, nah, I can't I can't rely on anybody else anymore. It's time to do my own thing. So yeah, yeah how did the pandemic affect you in terms of <laughs> in terms of that? Great question. So you see literally the pandemic was because we we had our own studio, right? So what happened is I literally went in one day and like my coach messaged me and he was like, listen, you're gonna, it's, it's done now. It's done. And I was like, what? No, it's not done. You know? And he was like, trust me. He said, with what's happening in, with everything, just get your head around being online. And uh, I didn't really take that in. And then obviously by the end of the day, my clients were messaging me saying, are you going to stay open and that? And uh, mate, I was just like, what's happening here? And um, from that day, I never, I, I didn't go back. I just didn't go back. Like it, we closed before the official dates and I shifted my mind. I said, look, I'm going to be online. And my coach kept telling me like, you need to go online. The kind of personality you are, your character, what you offer, you need to go online. It's more inclusive. You get better results and stuff. And then um, <laughs> me and my missus just sat and thinking, bro, the money, what's happening when we had the online clients and they're not, our core income was still coming from a particular, I was like, what happened? And then, to be honest, Jay, I know a lot of people are like, hearing this is the best thing that ever happened to me, bro. I've, I've still got my studio. It's, it's taught me the importance of like knowing who you are and what you can offer and what services for you. And I, and I still think that some people should PT because that's what they're good at. But I know that this is the right thing for me. And um, other than I like yourself, other than training my coach and a, and a friend, I'll never go back to PT bro. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love that. So. So then in terms of what you see now, right? So, you know, you help dads, you get them in amazing shape, you, you change their mindset yeah. and, and their physical. Like, what, what would you say are some of the common issues you come across when it comes to fathers and, and their health and their fitness, man? Yeah, we, it's a massive, we need a massive, like, I don't even know if this is an official word, like unlearning, like of like how we, like, especially like the, the ages have happened. Like we, 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 we've got to the point where we have a lot more access to information and, and the ability to educate ourselves, man. We have to step away from what our parents told us, which was, and they told us life was meant to be this particular way. This is what you're meant to do. And I think we need to step away from it. I think we need to own our success. We're very privileged. We lived it, a lot of my clients live in the UK and, and they think that the best thing for them is to get a job, <laughs> pay their mortgage and retire, right? But I think that's very much an old school approach, and I think we can we can we can expand on that. We can look after ourselves. We can be better examples for our children. I think I, I think we can stop accepting the middle aged bread at thirty five. Mm. I think there's I think there's a lot of things, and I think and I think a lot of it comes from like what we've been told what is the way that we're meant to be, the edu- the, the education that we've had, and and. Self awareness, you know, Jay. I think I think the big thing. A lot of men I speak to, they deem themselves as successful because they have a particular income, right? And I, I think that's a very low bench, benchmark. I think success needs to, again, be expanded out, man. Mm. What health, man? Can a lot of men in their forties not being able to touch their toes or do their right. laces, you know, <laughs> uh, or not being able to play in the park with their kids, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and 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 but they, they deem themselves successful because they can. They, they have an income and they can get boozed up on the weekend, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then those are some of the things that some of the guys you get on calls with, that's what they come to you with, right? Like not being able to, they can't keep up with their kids anymore or things like that. Yeah, and it's beyond that, Jay. I think, I think if we just, if we just look at, look at society in itself, look, look at statistics, like it's, it's just, it's just evident, mm. right? Um, look, if we've just come through a pandemic, man, what about obesity? What about diabetes? What about, um, high blood pressure. What about these things, man? They, they need to be just look, 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 look at what is exhausting our NHS, right? Look at, look at 
I don't know, man. I, I don't. As I said, I'm not just a statistic guy, but you just you tell me what you see. Mm. So when with the people that I come to, very much have these problems yet, but I also see these problems in society. You know, mm. so so they're, yeah. they're just a reflection of of what's happening around them. Yeah, you tell me, but I, I get I, for me. I don't think I can personally solve the crisis yet, but I think it's like the whole like re-educating people on maybe what we deem success as from an early age. You know, maybe mm. I, I often say to people like. Um, P- people will be so adamant that their child goes to a good school, that their child receives tutoring, education, yeah, but what about the nutrition their child eats? It's like, it's like listen, man, t- nutrition, sleep and stuff are going to affect your child's quality of life as much as the money they earn, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. that's not, to, that's not to, to neglect that particular academic area. It's just, it's just a fact, man, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? It's it's crazy. You even talk about the nutrition side of it. I was actually on a call the other day. I was trying to make a sell with somebody, and and they were saying they were saying why they couldn't sign up to the program. Oh, it's too expensive. To do that. And I was like, okay, cool, no problem. But you t- you just told me that you order Uber Eats three times a week. What if I told you we could save you money, which will pay for the program in itself if you order Uber Eats maybe once a week instead? And she just started going off at me. She was like, yeah, but my kids. So I was like, mm-hmm. to her, well, what if your kids start eating healthy? What kind of example are you setting? Mm-hmm. And she, yeah, it was just, it was a, it was an interesting conversation. But, but that's self awareness, right? Isn't it? That's self awareness. That's right. at the base of it is self awareness. But I, I think it, it's, it's deep rooted. It's deep rooted, especially amongst a certain class, right? That, like we, like for me, for me, I remember growing up, man. I remember like I couldn't wait to get to the point to have money to have takeaways, you know, mm. like that kind of stuff. Yeah, and like some people. Fortunately, with what I was exposed to, I'm like, not to, not to demonize takeaways because you can eat the right thing on it, but um, your takeaway finances shouldn't get in the way of your health. Mm. Right. And, and that's why I think it's an education thing. And I think it's got, stop, and it's like, it's got like, you've got to press the reset button and we've got to be like, okay, cool. It's fantastic that we're earning this amount, X, Y amount, but what are you reinvesting into yourself? What example are, are you setting amongst your house? And it, these are uncomfortable questions, you know? What, you, you have a great job. You dress well. You've got designer clothes, right? But you are overweight. You smoke. You drink heavy. You're, you're uh, what's the term? An alcoholic, they're, they're a functional alcoholic, you know? It seems as though, as long as your finance is in place, you can, you can pay for the cracks. Right. Especially, especially, as, especially as among, amongst men. And these are the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have. And yeah. people find it offensive, don't they, Jay? Yeah, like say, yeah. Why do you yeah. drink every day? I'm allowed to drink. I'm not an alcoholic. I, I, I didn't say he was alcoholic, man. You know, <laughs> so right. that's, that, that, that's what I'm trying to like um, educate people. Yeah, on, you know, I'm going to start using that term as well. Functional alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an official term. So, yeah. so please Google it. I think yeah. it's an official I'm, term. I want to find out, find out about that. Cool. Yeah. So another thing as well, you know, when it comes to your social media, you're very open. You're like very, very, uh, I like to, I'll say you're very vulnerable in terms of the things you talk about. You talk about your family, you talk about your kids, you talk about being a father, the struggles you faced. Where does that come from? And like, what gives you the confidence to, to be so open? Because, you know, you know what men are like. We, we don't, we don't want to say certain things. We ain't going to talk about certain things. So like, where does that come from? So I want to connect with people. Like, on a, on a, I want to resonate with people at that level. Vulnerability, right? Because I feel as though, Social media, work, everything, man. We're always trying to connect, like, at our highest level. Like, look at the car I got. Look at the, look at the car I got. Look at the Mercedes I got. Look, look at my house, man. I just bought my house, Jay. You know, like that. For me, I'm, I think if you connect at that kind of base level and a little bit more vulnerability, man, it, it, it removes all the pressures, man, and, and, and we can solve problems. But the problem is when we're connecting at that level where it's, like, superficial level, man, it's like, man, look, look at my new tracksuit, like, and... and there's a time and place for it, but I just think for me, I want to I wanna be a tad more vulnerable. I want people to reach out to me, not just patting me on the back for what I've achieved, but also to, to say, look, man, can you help me solve this problem? I, I was there. I was there because I've done it. You know, I've seen a post and I've seen someone, I'm like, man, oh, my man's got five kids. How did he, how did he become successful? Mm. You know, and, 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 and that's what I reach out to. I don't just reach out because I see a guy with a Lamborghini. Like, what's he been through? Like, mm. I need to... <laughs> so for me, when I'm being vulnerable is a way for me to both help people, but also be helped, you know? So and I'm not afraid to be laughed at. And I've been criticised, you know, being vulnerable. And I talk about being crying and people like being like, man up and stuff like that. I'm like, all right, okay, whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and have, have, would you, have you always been like that, though, in terms of, like, the openness? No, 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 man. I lost my dad. I lost my mum, man. I was in a certain place, you know, and I, and I realised that, like, 
the biggest reason why I was going around in this circle is because I was like putting on a front, Jay. I was putting on a front and I was pretending to be um, happy. I was pretending to know the answers to my problems and I was pretending to be like, I enjoyed this routine and I pretended, yeah. you know, like that kind of stuff. So it, it was, it, it did hit a point where I was like, man, something else has got to work, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I thought, and when I do things now and they, and they, and they feel right within, I continue to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that yeah. like sometimes as well, even from a social media perspective, I find that when when you're more when you're more heartfelt and it's and it's real, people connect with it more anyway. Like people are yeah. gonna reach out to you more as well. Or the people you want anyway, Jay. The yeah. people you want. Yeah, the people you want, want. exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, can't take on everybody, man. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. um cool. All right. So obviously from a coaching perspective, the Especially as you you kind of cut you, your thing is dad uh, dads right men 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 with children men who maybe they're working they got kids there's a lot of excuses when it comes to not being able to yeah. exercise so what are some of the practical things you like put in place for your clients like to make sure that they can actually fit in exercise throughout the day because we all know that's probably one of the biggest objections or I get on a call sometimes. It's like, okay, I, I ain't got the time to do this. I'm like, well, you can, you do, maybe you just ain't planned it, but like, what, what are some of the things you put in place for some of the people you work with? I have a fantastic question. So, you know, for me, Jay, like, um, it all starts with me and how I, um, because I qualify a client. So, I work, so as much as we, as much as we, we want clients, we call, I qualify. So that's how I get my work to be so high. So, being an eternal disciplined man, appreciating the fact that I may not earn as much money now, but qualifying my clients allows me to go on these journeys and get and get the results. So way before you even come with me, Jay, I'm saying to you, like, listen, man, we're gonna we're gonna talk regular, and we're gonna address your excuses. I don't I don't, I don't want to even want to hear from you in the good times. We're just gonna speak about your excuses, yeah. So so that once people kind of understand that that's the kind of personable relationship we're going on right i think it kind of sets precedence for when we actually reach that point i mean like hold on wait didn't we say that the morning oh, but the morning but didn't we say you was going to say that you know so with the accountability because uh, for the way i've structured and how i do it I, I work with a number of people at a particular time so it allows me to get on the phone and say jay you're lying you know jay, jay you just lied you just lied and it, it, all right cool if you're not saying you're lying you've got 20 minutes later uh, funny, uh, what about tomorrow? You know, so w- with me, that personable thing, because the thing is, I think the problem with the industry that we're in, Jay, is people think it's all maths and science and information, right? Listen, if that was the case, everyone would look like Cristiano Ronaldo. People would just pick up this piece of information, read it, and, and, and okay, cool, that's what I need to do, and I'll do it. It's not, is it? It's emotions. It's very real, Jay, you know? And, 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 and that's how these some of these terrible products sell, you know, because they tap into people's emotions. So for me... I say to you, look, look, man, what I, what the, whatever I program for you, yeah, it doesn't make a difference if you don't do it. It's how you execute it. So I focus heavily on earning your trust, earning your trust. I need you to believe in me, allowing me to communicate with you and the transparency. So if you're lying to me, all right, cool, just, all right, just tell me the truth. You, all right, cool, you mm. didn't do it. All right, what can we do now? Mm. Does that make sense? So mm. we have like levels of it. We have levels of it. So you're saying you're really struggling for motivation today. You're struggling to walk outside your house for 15 minutes. Uh, what's that going to do? Trust me. Just get out. Just get out. Does that make sense? Mm. Uh, so you try to take it step by step with them. Well, that's what coaching is. We have coaching and we have programming. We have coaching and we have programming. This word coaching is like overused. What for me, from, from, from my definition, man, I'm coaching you, Jay. Look, man, whatever I put, whatever I program for you today, might have to change, man. <laughs> Listen, Jay, man, you're not in a good headspace, man. Next two days, go off the grid, man. Stay off of WhatsApp and go for a walk. <laughs> mm. And, you know, then, and then go on, no, continue. Because I want results. You see, I want results. I want to, I want to, so I believe that my results will speak volumes and I will get success that way. The, I think the biggest problem is people want results, but they don't want to put in a kind of, you know, so, so that's why people stay at that level of like getting, okay, results. Me, I'm yeah. prepared to say, listen, I'm going to talk to you. You're going to get results, bro. And then that will speak for itself. And, and, and I'll build my client base for that way. Yeah. And then, to add to that, then from a nutrition perspective, now we know another another thing people say is, well, I can't meal prep, but I ain't got the time, or the missus the missus does all the cooking, or the missus won't be happy if I've got to be eating this while everybody else is eating that, or we order takeaway two times a week. I can't change that. The missus won't be happy. Like what? How do you? How are you coaching people on that perspective? So tough, so tough. Nutrition is the hardest thing to be yeah. honest because yeah. I think it's the people things 
For one, is people so uneducated on the area. And for two, it's the easiest one to lie about, right? And I think with men, men prefer to work hard than eat well. You know, so and, and it's another it's another thing that we've been taught, you know, that oh it's all right to work, it's just just and then once you work hard, you can eat crap, you know. So <laughs> it's like compromising. So with nutrition, I'm very big on compromising. This whole idea of shifting your diet overnight and becoming this like monk doesn't ex- well, it doesn't exist on the level that I work at, right? Because the people that are coming to me are 35 and been on all the diets in the world. You know, so for me I'm saying sustainably we have to compromise if you are <laughs> the other day I had some guy who was like, man, I love um, jollof rice. And I was like, do I have to stop eating it? You know? And I'm like, well, not really. You know, like if you, if you can factor it in, but we just have to be a tad more delicate with what we eat around it, you know? So for me, with nutrition, I'm, I'm very compromising unless that particular individual has, has very short-term goals, you know, like, oh, in two weeks, then we have to be a little bit more um, stricter. But my, my, whole, my whole thing with nutrition, man, is... Look, <laughs> It's a re-education. Look, stop. Look, man, you, you, it's not about, it's not just one shape that's going to change it. Just relax. This is what we're going to do. We're going to look at our portion sizes. We're going to look at our uh, protein intake. We're going to monitor it. We're going to track foods. You need to understand that for 30 years, you've been eating wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, let's say you get a, get a client what are some of the things that you put in place? Like, do you give them a meal plan or is it like, okay, we assess what you're doing already and maybe it's just about maybe cutting back, maybe instead of two big spoons of rice, you're having one big spoon <laughs> and more chicken. Like, are you re- are you trying to give, like, yeah, in terms of how you yeah. actually put it into action, like, what what, what are you doing? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the worst person to work with, yeah, if you think that, like, like there's one way that, like, I'm just going to message you and you're, and you're just going to be left alone, right? So... I'm going to, first and initially, we're going to, you're going to come on board and I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that I'm going to expect you to lie about. <laughs> then I'm going to track what you do. I'm going to ask you to give video every evidence of what you do. So that the accountability is through the roof. And only when you earn my trust, as much as I'm trying to earn your trust here, that, that we change that. So you, you understand the re-education to it. It's like p- people, people like to, to, to use the word, discipline yeah they don't really have discipline jay in, in the, what they have is like spurts of motivation right? what, what, what 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 i try to do is like you see that first phase man I, I, it's even fluffy yeah so what i'm saying to you is okay if we can continuously introduce these new habits that i'm telling you to do potentially we can develop some discipline you won't become disciplined you develop some bit discipline and discipline supersedes motivation right mm. so when, when people come on board jay the nutritional program that I give them might just mean just track. Just you, you, you need to, you, you know, you don't even need a nutrition program yet. You just need to track. Sometimes these people, when they come on board and just track, then they realize how bad they're eating and naturally they start to make changes. The, 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 uh, the problem on my end is before I used to think I knew it all. So I thought this seven day nutritional program is, is art. It's, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, man, if this guy ain't going to execute and his problem is, is he emotional eats every Friday night, 3000 calories. What's the point of me thinking I've ripped the Mona Lisa of... of yeah. So I'm just saying, just track. All right, Friday's our problem. Okay, Friday's our problem. This is how we're going to count Fridays. You're going to reduce your fee, 3,000 calorie binge down to 1,500 calories. You're going to introduce a walk. So now we've got an energy balance of here and we've lost three, like, three pounds per week. Results start to breed confidence. Confidence breeds momentum and voila, you know? Yeah, but, that, yeah. but that only works on a personal level. So I would never suggest, if there's any PTs watching this here, don't try and do this. If your client base is 150 clients, you know, like, if that's how you scale, that that just won't work. Yeah, just won't work. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be done on a personal level. Yeah, cool, man. So before I let, before we wrap this up, before I let you get on with your day, um, in terms of, I just want you to kind of describe to me then, for for the men out there, um, who maybe they are struggling to get in shape. Uh, they've tried multiple things. Obviously, they should just hit you up. But if they can't hit you up, maybe they ain't ready to make that step yet. What are like the top the top three things? you would suggest some of these men to start doing today to at least try and get on their way to, to success when it comes to health and fitness? Okay, yeah, well, um, well, tracking calories. Tracking calories is essential. Uh, the, the, the misunderstanding, the lack of education in that area is massive. Download my fitness power and start tracking calories. Um, introduce um, walking into your routine. This is for someone that's entirely inactive. Introduce walking as a regular activity, daily activity, and 
if there was a third thing I'd say it would be resistance and that's of, I say that because that's often the most neglected so especially like the 30 plus generation we always use cardio as the way to get into shape yeah we're, we're, look, man you, you can use cardio but I'm saying to you the body that most people desire has muscle to build muscle you need, you need resistance so mm-hmm. that, those are the things that I think people neglect the most when starting out a journey um, tracking the calories my fitness pal is a free app Walking is a powerful tool to weight loss. Walking is a powerful tool. You bet you, you're not going to get injured from it. You can do it forever. There's no real excuses. You don't need equipment. And resistance, re- resistance is key, man. If you, if you have a desire to have, it, to have a physique that has muscle, abs, or whatever, you need resistance. Man. Yeah, yeah. And then to add to that, why is it important for, for fathers to, to, to get in shape and, and at least you know, elevate their health? It is important because... Uh, we need to lead by example. If an unhealthy parent is, I've had, there's a statistic is, high is the chance of an unhealthy child, right? We, we, we would never, we'd never advocate our children being stupid. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's not advocate our children being unhealthy, right? right. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good comparison right there. Cool, man. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate it. Um, Lastly, where can the listeners find you on the socials, man? Uh, Facebook, you can join my Superdad community. Um, just have a look on there. There's a, there's a sim- Superman symbol with an S in the middle. Damien Scanner on Facebook and Superdad Demo on Instagram. Okay, man. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Guys, don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you like this episode with Dr. Demo, Superdad. <laughs> Helping all the dads across the world. Uh, really appreciate it. The Spectrum of Health uh, podcast episode. This is like 22, 23, something like that. Um, peace. <laughs>